Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, I got you. All right. All right. We're good. You know, there, there was a Sunday school teacher that had, she had just concluded her class and wanted to make sure everybody had made, that she had made her point with everybody. She taught, taught a child ministry. She said, can anyone tell me what you must do before you can obtain forgiveness of sin? As you can think, the whole class is silent. Everybody's like looking around. Nobody wants to answer. Finally, a little boy in the back raises his hand and he says, Miss Thompson, sin. You have to sin before you can be forgiven of sin. <laughs> Good point. I was like, you know, that, I mean, really, if you think about it, I guess you got to sin before you can be forgiven of sin, right? <laughs> you know, forgiveness is something that it just seems so simple, right? We kind of seen a video on it, talked about it a little bit. We accept Jesus into our life. We make him the center of our life. And we're forgiven of our sins, right? Are we good? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know I was getting hands. Oh, that's okay. We're good. So we accept Jesus into our life and we are forgiven of our sins, right? Seems pretty simple and to the point. It's the point of being a Christian, making Jesus the, the, the Lord of your life. When you do, you're forgiven of your sins and you're able to go to heaven. If you think about it, forgiveness is something that's central to the message of the gospel, right? This is what sets Christianity apart from the rest of the world is forgiveness. And this is what we're going to discuss today. The title of today's message is The Lord's Prayer, Forgiveness, Part 1. If you will, turn to Matthew 6, 9. We've been, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. I, I think this is one of my most favorite Studies I have done in a long, long time. I just, I, I can't wait. I study ahead. I, I just, you really see these things and you can read through it. But when you really study it, you realize what Jesus is telling you here. Now, Jesus, he prayed often. He, he knew that, that prayer was powerful. He knew that prayer was vital to one, one being able to keep their faith, right? If you think about it, we have a direct line to the creator of the universe. We have our own red line, like, like you have the red line that calls the White House. We have a direct line to the creator of the universe through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to remember who we are talking to when we are praying. This is serious stuff, and we need to treat it like serious stuff. The disciples would ask Jesus, they would say, Jesus, teacher, teach us how to pray. In this great sermon that Jesus delivered, the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6, 9, Jesus says, In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, always address who you are praying to. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. We pray that your name will be set above all others. We pray that your name will be set above anything else in this world. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. God's will for all of us is to accept Jesus Christ. And then it says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. When we pray that, we are acknowledging where all of our, where everything that great happen to, happens to us, where it comes from. And then we get to the verse we want to be looking at today. Matthew 6, 12. It says, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. The Greek word here for debts is Ophelima. This translates to what is owed. You, so you borrow some money from somebody, you owe them some money. You do services for somebody, you, they owe you money. Now we have to remember, Matthew was a tax collector. He, he was a money man. He was what we might think of as a banker nowadays. He knew all about collecting 
debts. He dealt with what people owed them. Now, this prayer is not asking that, that we be freed from what we owe others. It's not say, go rack up your credit card and, and pray that your debt be forgiven. Those are monetary debts. This is not a prayer asking for monetary obligations to be relieved. This is more important than all of that. You know, Paul tells us in his letter to the Romans, in Romans 6, 23, he says, for the wages of sin is death. What we are talking about here is our sin debt. The cost of sin is death. At its core, sin, if you think about it, is rebellion against God. We've been seeing it in Sunday school, looking at the nation of Israel, their rebellion against God. Plain and simple, sin is rebellion against God. For some reason, we like to sugarcoat it. We won't make it comfortable like we talked about. Make it okay, make people feel comfortable. You know, we want them to get their warm and fuzzies. No, sin is sin. It's rebellion against God. Now, the cost of sin is death. We're not going to collapse of a heart attack because we sin. We're not just going to have a stroke because we committed a sin. This is what we're not. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a something worse, a spiritual death. Romans 3.23, I won't put this on the screen for us. It says, for all have sinned. It says all, don't say some. It says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. You know, a, a misconception out there is a, a lot of people, they think hell is a place for really bad people in this world. The bad of the bad. The worst of the worst. The Hitlers, the, 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 the Al-Qaeda, the, the, the other ones. All, the bad of the bad. This is what we think hell is reserved for is the bad of the bad. The most evil people in the world. This is such a big misconception. This is another big misconception out there. God wouldn't send good people to hell, would he? He's a loving God. Why would he do that? You know, someone, someone told me a couple weeks ago that he knew he was going to heaven. I was like, praise God. He said, you want to know how I know? I said, I, I would love to hear how you know you're going to heaven. His answer was because all of the good that he does in this world. He, 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 he lets people borrow stuff. He helps his neighbor work on things. He... He's always helping people. All the good he does in this world, he is a good person. He know, and that's why he knows he's going to heaven. There's so many people that believe this. That's their way to get to heaven. It's through their works. This deception by Satan is more prevalent than you think. One, need, one thing we need to be clear on since the fall of Adam and Eve, since the fall of Adam and Eve, we are all, our fate for all of us is a one-way ticket to hell. Once we reach the age of accountability, that is when we know right from wrong, when God says that person knows right from wrong, they know what they're doing, we're on a pathway to hell. It's plain and simple. It's the ugliest. This is nasty stuff nobody wants to talk about. It does not matter how much your good works you do in this world. No matter how great of a person you are, there is nothing that anybody that walks this earth can do to earn their way to heaven. This is very uncomfortable stuff for people to talk about. I, I, I was shaking in my boots to get up here and talk about this. This is why it's so sugar-coated, because it is so, it, it's just, it is, it's the reality. Nobody wants to hear the reality. But we all need to make sure we understand, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But, there's some good news. Romans 3.24 says, being justified 
freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is kind of worded like Yoda in Star Wars. We work words things backwards. We are freed through his grace. We are freely. We have, we have a free gift of grace. We are justified. We are freed thanks to the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. The key word here is justified. This means to, to acquit, to plead for the innocent of, to be vindicated, to be freed, to be saved. We are saved by the free grace that is offered to us through Jesus Christ. The day we made Jesus Christ the Son of the living God, our Lord and Savior in our life, the day we placed Him in our heart, made Him the center of our life, our sin debt was paid in full. We have been redeemed when we do that. We were freed. We were, we were taken off that bus on that one-way trip to hell. We were, we were freed. We were once separated from God, living a life of despair, unhappiness, shame, and guilt. But we are freed from that, and we are freed from that prison of hell. All because of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen. So the question is, do we fully understand what we have been saved from because of this forgiveness offered to us through Jesus? Do, do we understand just how truly bad hell is? Do we truly understand the magnitude of this forgiveness that we have received? Jesus tells the story of a rich man and a beggar named Lazarus, right? When they both, you know, Lazarus was covered in, in sores and he was a beggar. And there was this rich man that would walk past Lazarus. He wouldn't give him the time of the day. Lazarus just wanted some crumbs that fell off the table because he was hungry. Both of them died on the same day. And both of them were, were went, both of them died on the same day. Lazarus was sent to a place of comfort called Abraham's bosom. And then the, the rich man was sent to a place that he called constant torment called Hades. The rich man, he looked up. He looked up. He was in constant torment. And he looked up and he saw Abraham far off. He said, Father Abraham, can, can you have mercy on me and send Lazarus over with some, some water to cool the tip of my tongue from this constant fire? Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And then right here, the next verse I want to show, share with you guys. Luke 16, 26 says, And besides all this, besides all, no matter how bad we want to help you, no matter what, besides all of this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can you pass from there to us. Now, this word says gulf. This is a little misleading. We think of the Gulf of Mexico, right? But gulf translates here to a, a chasm, a great void, a separation. There's a separation between those in Hades and us in heaven. Once you are there, you are there. There is no turning back. There's no redos. There's no more second chances. How many times do we ever hear the words, I will get to that one day? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have time for Jesus right now, but I, I'm going to get to that one day. It sounds so appealing. I love your message, but I'm going to get to it one day. Hey, hey, you know, go, go ahead and live your life for a while. People say, hey, I'm going I'm to live my white life for a while. Others will tell them, yeah, go ahead and live your life for a while. Enjoy yourself. You deserve it. Isn't that what we hear a lot? Enjoy what the world has to offer you. Go enjoy it. You deserve it. 
You can always get to that eternity stuff later. You, you'll have time. We have to remember we are never promised tomorrow. When you're called up, the time is over. It's done. There is no redos, no take backs, no, none of it. Now, hell is a nasty place that we cannot even begin to imagine how bad it is. I read somewhere that says Jesus talks about hell more than he does heaven. He compared hell to, to a place uh, called Gehenna outside of Jerusalem. This was a trash dump where they dumped all the trash. It was full of maggots and bugs. If you've ever been to a dump, it's a nasty place. He compared hell to Ghana in Mark 9. Jesus said, said hell is a place of unquenchable fires. Constant torment. He said it's not just darkness, but it is the eternal darkness. That means everlasting darkness. There's no light. I've seen a deal in, uh, about the um, uh, people that worked in Antarctica. You know, and they had the ones that are there during the summer than the ones at night. I mean, uh, the winter. They're there for like three months. There's no sunlight. And they got it's condition. I forgot they called it. But these people start to almost go crazy because they don't see the sunlight. They don't see any light. This is a place of constant, eternal darkness. This is what we were saved from. You know, you remember how a few weeks ago we talked about there was this, I don't remember what it was, but Jesus had told them that the people in hell, they will gnash their teeth and be in constant torment and regret. And I gave the illustration to, to understand gnashing our teeth and, and, and wailing, being in constant torment. I said, go home, get a hammer, hit your, hand, your thumb as hard as you can, and then you will be gnashing your teeth and in constant torment. Now imagine if that's just constantly going over and over and over and over and somebody's hitting your toes and you're in constant pain. It never ends. And then you had the regret of wishing I would have took this stuff more serious. And then you're in complete constant darkness with immense heat and fire around you the whole time you're regretting those choices. This is what we were saved from when Jesus forgave us of our sins. We were saved from eternal darkness, eternal fire, eternal misery, eternal torment, eternal agony, eternal regret, eternal gnashing of our teeth with no relief in sight. This is what we were saved from through the forgiveness that Jesus offers us. Praise God. So the question is still, I, I'm, I'm one I love to ask questions. So the question is, if we are saved from our sins when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then why do we need to pray and ask for forgiveness daily? Well, here's a little piece from the world according to Ben. This can be scary, but this is my take on it. First, we need to ask for forgiveness constantly because we need a reminder of the gospel. We need a reminder of what we have been saved from. We need a reminder of what we have overcome. Do we ever remember when we first accepted Jesus into our life? What, what did we experience? We were on fire. For the Lord. We were on fire. That is all we cared about was God. We want the whole world to know about it. Nothing was going to stand in our way. We remember that, that we, what we had been saved from. When we remember this, it helps stoke that fire that is inside of us. Trust me, we all at times need our fire stoked because it, it will start to die down. But we need that fire stoked. It also helps us to, to remember to treat others how Jesus would have treated them. 
It helps us to be able to love others and look over petty stuff. It helps us to keep our, our life on the, what do we call it, the straight and narrow. Meaning we keep our life on track. This means we do not veer off course. Well, let's think about what, what is our life like when we veer off the course we should be on? What is our life like when we are stuck in a ditch? When the train comes off the tracks, however you want to describe it, what is our life like then? You know, I, I can remember some t somebody saying one time, we were asking for a prayer request and a Bible study, and this person said, you know, my prayers, I, I'm just called up to heaven because I just have no joy in my life anymore. Just hurt me to hear that. Just hurt me. No joys in their life. Do we ever have times where we, we feel guilty or ashamed of something? Do we ever feel empty? Do we ever have times in our, in our life with, with, with just no joy? Worse, do we ever have times where we feel like God is silent in our life? Do we ever feel disconnected or do we ever feel confused about life? Just know, God, we don't serve a God of confusion, so just remember that. Do we ever feel like nothing is going right for us? You know, life is full of hills and valleys, hills and valleys. Hills are good times, valleys are not. We have to remember that sin, like we said earlier, is rebellion against God. When we are rebelling against God, look, look at the Israelites, the Israels, Israelites. We've been studying about them in Sunday school. They rebel against God. When we rebel against God, what are we doing? We are separating ourselves from God. It doesn't always have to be murder or stealing or, or adultery, the major things we think about. Jesus left us with two laws. Love God more than anything else in our life and love our neighbors as we would ourselves. Maybe it's simple. We are, feeling, we are harboring ill feelings towards somebody that we just won't let go. Or maybe we're doubting God. We're, putting our, we're placing our fear of the world above God and we're doubting God. Maybe we're, we're placing something that seems so harmless above God. It could be a hobby and enjoyment. Oh, I love it so much. And we put God on the, ba a pedestal, or, uh, on the back shelf. We put that up here. Maybe we had a hold of something that we need to let go of, but we just don't want to. This can be anything from, from an addiction to, to just good old anger. Any, there's a lot of things we can grab a hold of, we pick it back up, we don't want to let go of it. Maybe we had, had a hold of something that, and it's causing some friction between us and God. I can think of so many things that I did to strain the relationship between me and my parents from about the age of 14 to 30. They still loved me, but, but there, there was a strain between us because of all the dumb stuff that I did. There'd be times when our relationship was good and there was times that I just, just broke their trust. I just did things that just put a... a, a the, something that just caused distance between us. There was fusion between us. They still loved me. They didn't deny me. Helped me out any way they could. But there'd be times where I would put some fusion between us. I'd like to close out with a story out of the Bible to help explain another reason why we should pray to God for forgiveness every day. In Luke 15, there's a story that most people know. It's called what? The prodigal son. There's a father he had, we, we all know it, there's a father, he had two sons, right? 
And one son said, hey, give me my inheritance. Give me what you owe me. The father did, and, and the, what we all know, the son went out and, and lived a reckless life, right? Or a short reckless life. That's what prodigal means. It means to live lavishly and, and recklessly. I'm sure it was on, on, on spent on harlots and a good time and all the things that you waste money on. This father worked so hard for what he had. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure he worked really hard to amass that legacy for his kids to pass on. A lot, of what, a lot of what we call blood, sweat, and tears. Just think about it. God's inheritance to us cost him something, right? He sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for us. Our salvation come at a price. Now this father's son didn't he didn't just get off track. He got way off track. We have all had times like that where, where you have got off track in our life. Where we, we put our relationship with God on the back burner. The day we accept Jesus Christ into our life, there's going to be a constant battle, right? A constant battle where Satan is going to try to do everything he can to drive a wedge between you and God. Satan wants us to get so far off track that we turn our back on God and, and slam the door on Jesus. I'm tired of that mess. It's full of hypocrites anyway. I, I don't want to deal with that. How does he do it? He fills us with pride. He, 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 he just goes after our greed and our lustful desires. He will put these custom-made temptations in front of us and make us think we cannot live without them. Then we will start to place them above God. There's a constant battle between darkness and the light of God for your soul. So easy for our life to get off track. I spent 20 years of my life off track. But hopefully we're like the prodigal son. And as it said in the scriptures, the prodigal son it said he came to himself. That means that he came to his senses. He realized how foolish he was, how foolish he'd been. He realized what he was doing was wrong. When we realize life was so much better, he realizes life was so much better before. I love to look at, I'm going to look at what the words of the prodigal son says as he is going to do after he comes to his senses. He just come to his senses, Luke 15 18 says, I will arise and go to my father. I'm going to get up and go back to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. When we are harboring sin in our life, we are rebelling against God and we are distancing ourselves from God. If you're a Christian, you will have that Holy Spirit inside of you and it will convict you. It's your conscience. It will, hey, this is not right. Hey, whoa, that's a bad idea. Hey, no, no let's not do that. Or you done something and it just eats you up and makes you feel like a fool. We have two choices. We can either listen to it and correct our mistake or we'll justify it. We'll make an excuse or we'll try to numb it somehow. To shut it up. Because it's tormenting us. When we do this, we are rebelling against God. He sent his helper to guide us. And we're rebelling against God. We are distancing ourselves from his love. He's not distancing himself. We are distancing ourselves. But when we repent and realize that the sin we have been harboring in our life we repent and we change our ways and we go before God and ask him to forgive us, we remove that boundary. We remove that, that barrier. When we, when we do this and truly feel it in our heart, then we're showing, we're showing, listen to me, we're showing our Father in heaven that we have acknowledged our wrongdoing. Amen. 
We're showing that we have acknowledged our wrongdoing and we acknowledge that we need to repent from it. For sin to be forgiven, you have to repent. You have to turn from it. That's what we have to do to change from it. We have to repent and turn from it. Go away from it. When we do this, our sin is forgiven. When we sin against God, we're rebelling against Him and we experience the brokenness that results. Feelings of despair, no joy. God seems silent. We're shutting them out. But when we repent and confess that sin to God, we are acknowledging that God to our Father in heaven and our desire to repent from it. This is why we need to de- pray daily to our Father in heaven, forgive us of our debts on a daily basis. Here's our last bit. I promise I'm almost done. What was the prodigal, son, a prodigal son's father's response? Luke 15, 24. It says, For this my son was dead. My son was dead but is alive again. He was dead, but now he is alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. And everybody began to be merry. What did Jesus say? He said, I I say to you likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people who need no repentance. So think, when you ask for forgiveness and you realize what you've done wrong and you've repented, just think of the joy that's going on in heaven. The angels are singing. All because you have asked for forgiveness and acknowledged your sin. All because we have a loving Father in heaven that's just as joyful over our return as a prodigal son. His father was of his return. Ask everybody, please stand.